Welcome to another episode of Tank Talks, your personal think tank for all things startups and venture capital. I'm your host, Matt Cohen, founder and managing partner at Ripple Ventures. On today's show, we welcome Akar Vachani, partner at Fairview Capital Partners, to discuss how institutional LPs are thinking about the venture industry these days. Akar shares his journey starting off his career on the institutional investor side at Cambridge Associates and how that gave him access to some of the best data on venture funds, along with the ability to meet some of the best GPs in the world. We dig into how the team at Fairview was way ahead of its time backing underrepresented managers before diversity was in focus and how the firm has evolved over the last 25 years. Akar shares his thoughts on what makes a good emerging manager and a long-term partner for his firm and how his team is navigating the venture markets these days with so many more managers to choose from. Lastly, we get Akar's take on the whole FTX situation and how he thinks it will impact traditional venture managers when it comes to LP's willingness to back riskier asset classes. But before we get started today, as our listeners probably know by now, the team at Ripple is always focused on helping our founders and portfolio companies find the best partners to work with. And when it comes to corporate finance and cash management, there's nobody we recommend more than the team at Jeeves. At Ripple, we manage all our fund expenses and employee credit cards using Jeeves. The team at Jeeves helped me get my team set up with physical and virtual cards in days. I was able to allow my teammates to expense items in multiple currencies, allowing them to pay for anything, anywhere, at any time. We weren't asked for any personal guarantees or to pay any setup or monthly SaaS fees. Not only does Jeeves save us time, but they also give us up to 3% cash back on our purchases, including expenses like Google, Facebook, or AWS every month. The best part is Jeeves puts up the cash and you settle once every 30 days in any currency you want, unlike some other corporate card companies that make you prepay every month. Listeners of Tank Talks can get set up today with a demo of Jeeves and take advantage of our Tank Talks special with a $250 sign-up bonus and skip the waitlist that already has thousands of companies waiting on it by visiting tryjeeves.com backslash tank talks. Use referral code tank talks to get set up today. Now let's jump into the tank for this week's episode with Akar Vachani from Fairview Capital Partners. Thanks for joining us in the tank today, Akar. Thanks, Matt. Excited to be here. You know, I appreciate you taking the time to share your thoughts on the venture capital markets these days and how limited partners and funds like yours are assessing the investment opportunities out there. But before we get started, it would be great if you can give our audience a brief background on how you ended up in the investment industry and how you started working on the capital allocation side of the business. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, like a lot of the LPs that you've had on on here, um, honestly, there wasn't a ton of intentionality to it early on in my career. You know, my first job, which actually started out as an internship was at an early fintech company. I was one out of, I think, six employees, and it was this identity verification software company, actually an early SaaS model for banks. You know, I was an economics and finance major, really loved tech, and and it was fun being on a small team like that. I I learned so much, but the company was being acquired. Uh, My parents wanted me to get a real job, and so I applied uh, among other places to a role with Cambridge Associates, which is a consulting firm that specializes in, in venture and private equity. You know, for the third time I applied, I was rejected for an internship and a full-time role, um, but they happened to be looking for an analyst slightly off cycle and I, I got the job. Um, it was fun. It was a great place to learn. I built some great relationships. And even though it was a big firm, I, I found ways to be entrepreneurial. So I think to this day, they still have the best private market return data and cash flow data. Um, But at that time, this was back in 2006, they weren't doing a lot with that data um, other than publishing benchmarks. So I found this opportunity to do more with it. And so like a long story short, ended up leading what we called uh, the quant team, which was like a 10 person team that did more advanced analytics on venture capital to private equity returns. And in addition to that work, I was processing like a hundred venture and private equity financials a quarter. And I was on like seven or eight consulting teams where I got to meet with managers. I was involved in due diligence, manager selection, asset allocation discussions, and all that work really tied things together for me and opened my eyes to how the investment world works. And I liked it. But at the end of the day, you know, I didn't feel like I had that true sense of ownership and decided that, you know, I'd want to be on the investment side. And Fairview happened to be hiring. There was a posting for an analyst position. It was based in Connecticut, which is where I grew up, where I was from. My family was like going through some challenges at the time. So it was, it was an opportunity to be back home and I took it. Um, and so this was in, in early in 2008, right before the market turned. So it's certainly an interesting time, uh, but a good time to be at a fund of funds that had raised capital recently and would be allocating. And at that time, we were like a quarter of the size we are today in terms of AUM. So I was fortunate to you know, be in this position 
to truly help the firm build over the years. And, and I've learned a lot and, you know, had a fair bit of responsibility to starting pretty early in my career. You know, it's amazing that you spent so much time getting to just absorb all the data that was being generated from Cambridge, you know, at, you know, at a time when there wasn't as much data as there is now on the venture capital asset class, you know, what kind of things were you noticing or seeing that was uh, eye opening to you during your time at Cambridge and what, you know, early managers did you get to sit down and meet with who ended up becoming, you know, the leaders of our industry, you know, 10 years later? Well, the, well, the data side of it, it's just fascinating. I mean, you know, when you think about the return drivers, you know, for for the industry every year. I think it was very clear, um, and maybe you know, it was, it, it was kind of understood. I think anecdotally and you know, generally, but there probably wasn't a lot of data. But Cambridge had great data on how its driven venture really is, and you know, how much the outlier returns, like individual companies, drove not only returns for the best funds, but also vintage year returns. So, like, even if you had you know, VCs that, uh, or, or sorry, LPs that were trying to, you know, have a broader portfolio, like, you know, their returns would be impacted in that way. So I think, you know, it was just, just really that, that was one anecdote. Um, you know, we, we did a lot of work on the buyout side too, and just like, you know, it, how individual deals impacted industry returns and industry narrative, you know, just, just pretty fascinating. And then, you know, in terms of like meeting managers, it, we just, I like, you know, Cambridge saw everybody. And um, so we, we, I, I probably met with hundreds of firms and, you know, I don't want to sing, single anybody out because, you know, it, it, at the risk of like not mentioning other folks. So I'll, I'll punt on that one. Sorry. That's okay. That's okay. Yeah. I mean, the power law book recently released by Sebastian Malaby obviously explains the, the rule of the, how, you know, home run returns generate, you know, 90% of the returns for the entire vintage year industry. And that's hold true for, you know, 50 years of this business. So, but Cambridge obviously had a lot of data to back it up, which is incredible to have a place for you to start your career, just absorbing all that data and then try to find your own path, which you did, you know, joining Fairview, which you've been at for almost 15 years, which is a crazy long time. And as you mentioned, you helped establish, you know, the firm's uh, first SF office, I heard. Given the incredible history of Fairview Capital and its early focus on backing underrepresented managers led by the co-founders, Larry Morris and Joanne Price, you know, what has been some of the most rewarding work that you feel most proud of during your time working at Fairview? Yeah, I, I really lucked in to working for Larry and Joanne early in my career. I honestly had no idea how special of a place Fairview was until I started working there. And you're right, like the history is really incredible. I mean, not only what Larry and Joanne did, but how they did it. So back in 1994, they set out to raise the first diverse and emerging manager fund of funds, but way ahead of their time. Um, and they were also leaders in how they thought about organizational diversity and culture for for private equity venture capital firm that was also way ahead of its time. You know, they were very intentional about the diversity of thought they brought onto the team. And you know, if you look at our team today, we have a mathematician, a doctor, an engineer, an economist, an accountant, um, just very networks and life experiences. And not only that, but they built this type of culture where everyone's voice was respected, you know, even me as an analyst when I started. And over the years, that's paid huge dividends because it's made us so much better at decision making. And the, the perspective we have is, you know, it's just so wide ranging. And especially, you know, when you're making long term judgments on people and strategies like we are investing in funds, it's, it's so valuable. Um, and, and so to your question, I think, you know, the most rewarding thing has been applying this approach in philosophy to backing new firms. You know, over the years, I think we've backed over 45 first-time funds now. Um, and, and in so many of those instances, we've literally been the first check, putting firms in business or being the largest or most critical LP. And you know those decisions combined with our work with those firms, I think completely tra changed the trajectories of those firms. And in a lot of those firms, you know, they've gone on to be early investors in some of the most consequential tech and healthcare companies built over the last few decades. So, 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 so just to see all that play out in my career at Fairview, which by the way, like all that still is in motion, you know, it's, it's, it's incredibly rewarding. And, and not to mention the fact that like a lot of the firms we backed were totally overlooked, you know, by, by most institutional investors. I mean, to think about how early they were on the DEI focus, underrepresented minority focus, 25 years plus ahead of really when DEI came into focus for a lot of people today is a huge risk for someone to take on. You know, who were some of the early backers 
that Larry and Joanne were able to convince that this was an area that should be focused on at a time when, you know, venture capital was still a cottage industry and it wasn't really well understood by a lot of institutional investors. You know, it was it was really public pension plans in the U.S. that, that were the early LPs for Fairview. And really, you know, up until like three or four years ago, public pension plans represented uh, the vast, vast majority of capital that went to diverse and emerging managers in the U.S. Um, I think only like 1% of capital came from endowments and foundations and, you know, the balance from like corporations. But I think over 80% of it came from public pension plans. And that was very true. I mean, I think almost all the capital came from public pension plans in the, in the early days. Well, I got to ask, you know, given the fact that backing underrepresented uh, and diverse managers was much harder than it is today, you know, how did Fairview start sourcing opportunities in the early days when it was very hard to find minority run firms? And, and what was the firm's original investment thesis? Yeah. So in, in the early days of the firm, I mean, the, again, this is almost 30 years ago, Fairview played the special role, which was kind of serving as a market catalyst in many ways, because the market, as you know, you pointed out, wasn't that big. There were maybe a couple dozen women and minority owned firms in the US. And for, for a firm like Fairview, it was pretty easy to cover the market, um, given the firm's networks and history. At that time, like, you know, Fairview put a lot of firms in business. The, the firm was like the sole LP in some things. You know, it was, it was really early days. But, but the thesis was that we believe that diverse overlooked firms, as well as smaller funds and newer firms and venture firms would outperform. And it's the same thesis we have today. But of course, you know, the market has evolved so much over, over that. Time. And has your deal flow sourcing evolved over the last you know, several years? I mean, yeah, totally. Right. Um, and just for full context, I guess, on Fairview, I mean, along the, along the way, over the years, we added a tenured manager program that focuses on like high Roman numeral firms that you, you know, most of the audience would recognize. Some of them have been around since the early days of the venture industry. We also added a direct uh, co-investment part to our co-investment, to our investment platform, you know, many, many years ago. So today we're investing through different pools of capital with, with tenured managers, uh, emerging managers, and, and then co-investing alongside them. But I think the deal flow, you know, sourcing question, I mean, that's, that's probably still most important with our emerging manager program. And, and our thesis, again, is the same. It's that, you know, we believe that the, the best small funds, new firms, and diverse managers will continue to outperform. And, and our market coverage goal is, is still the same as it was in the early days. We try to cover the whole market. We try to see every diverse and emerging manager firm in the market every year. And what has changed in the last several years is that it's just gotten so much harder, right? With an incredible amount of new firm formation that's been happening, um, it just takes way more effort on our part. But I think we get closer to that goal than, than most any other organizations. And the, the reason why it's important, the reason why you want as wide a funnel as possible and, and why you want to be as inclusive as possible with emerging manager investing is that there's such a high dispersion of returns, right? Venture as an asset class has some of the highest dispersion of returns, but within that, emerging firms increase that by an order of magnitude. And so essentially that means like the best firms will significantly outperform and, and conversely, the worst ones will do pretty bad. So you want to be investing with the best firms and you can't risk missing out a great, on a great opportunity just because you're not seeing enough of the market. You, you can have the best manager selection process in the world, but if you're not seeing the best opportunities, it, it doesn't matter. And as an LP, like the moment that you think that you have the right deal flow, and that you don't need to meet with new managers or that you think you have the best networks, like that's when you're, you're, you're going to fail. Um, and I think the same is for VCs, right? Like we'd much rather back a GP that's paranoid about missing out on a great deal and wants to see every deal in their area of focus versus ones that, you know, just rely on a small network or only inbound deal flow. So yeah, our, our approach is to see as much of the market as, as possible, which for us includes a tremendous amount of inbound deal flow because we have this reputation in the emerging manager space, but we couple that with a ton of proactive outbound sourcing. Um, and then, you know, and then we make decisions from there. Yeah. I mean, it's just exactly the same for us. The next great, you know, entrepreneur founder is most likely not going to know who we are at Ripple and we're not going to know who they are. And so we need to continue to, you know, invest time and in building out our, our 
brand and our platform and our network. And we can't just rest on the ones that we already know and, and continue to trust. So it's great to hear that firms, you know, on the allocation side, like yourself are still doing that as well after, you know, 25, 30 years in the business, you know, can you share a little bit about your kind of investment committee and due diligence process for making capital commitments, you know, for any emerging managers out there who you're curious to understand how it works on your side? Yeah. You know, I mean, every LP will be different, you know, for us, our investment committee is, is the firm's partners, you know, and we have discretion on our capital. We're true fund of funds. You know, we're, we're general partners. We raise capital from LPs and, and we actually invest alongside our LPs with our GP commitment. Um, so we're investing our own capital in every fund we choose to back. And, you know, our approach over the years, as you can imagine, you know, given, given the history and culture of the firm is it truly collaborative. And, you know, we make decisions as a team on a consensus basis. Everyone on the team is involved in every investment decision. We have specifically, you know, we, we have different diligence processes and, and plans for every fund that we you know, have in the pipeline. But at the high level, it's kind of a two-stage process. It, it entails everything that pretty much every VC firm would expect, right? Like looking at track record, evaluating strategy, reputations, brand, uh, et cetera. And, and all that stuff, like, I don't want to say it's easy, but it's it's kind of table stakes for LPs today. But I think where we're different is the it, kind of in two areas. I mean, one is our networks. Um, and when we use them to do a ton of like high trust off list reference calls and, and given how embedded we are in the industry, there's like never a, a GP that we don't have a connection to somehow. And so that is super valuable in our process. And then the, the other thing is just, we spend a ton of time on team, you know, especially with emerging managers, like team cohesion, understanding what drives the team, the commitment of teams to each other and their dedication of their careers to building the firm, that is really important to understand. And building a venture firm is never linear. It's hard. It takes grit. It takes tenacity. And I, I mean, you know this, right? Like you're, you're still relatively early in your journey in building Ripple. And I'm sure you've had your challenges and not everything has gone to plan. And so every firm goes through these things. And even the firms you think are top tier firms today, I, I promise you, they went through a lot of issues to get to where they are today. So what makes a firm successful after you've checked like those earlier boxes around strategy and, and track record and all that stuff is the ability to navigate these challenges as a team and, and work through them while maintaining an investment focus and focusing on returns. Yeah, absolutely. It's a lot of like the quantitative, but a lot of the qualitative stuff. I think like I also learned early on, there's a difference between being, being a good investor uh, but also being a good manager, you know, a managing partner versus just a general partner. There's a lot of differences in that. Um, and building a 25 year, you know, firm takes a lot of punches in the face uh, for you to continue to make it through the journey. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that I, I, I was told, but, you know, I really didn't know what it would feel like until it happens the first couple of times. And, and, you know, I've had a couple of those. So surviving is, uh, is definitely one of the key attributes that we would want to make sure their uh, fund managers know about that before getting into the business. Let's flip it to the other side of the equation, though. You know, what are some common mistakes and red flags that you see emerging managers do that just scare off LPs like yourself that uh, others out there should be aware of? Huh, boy, um, you know, I think one of the things that can, that can scare off LPs is just being overly salesy or, or aggressive. And I, I've seen this, I've seen a rise in this kind of behavior this year in particular. And I think it's because it, it's because there's more competition. Even this year, we saw more new firm formation than we did last year. So more in 2022 than 2021, uh, which is pretty crazy given given the market, right? And, and there's a lot of firms that entered the market last year that are still in the market. And on top of that, you have existing managers and tenured managers coming back for capital. It seems like all at the same time, kind of gearing up for early 23. And I think for LPs, you know, the LPs broadly, for obvious reasons, have not been as active in, in the later part of this year deploying and so all that's kind of created this crunch and there's a lot of capital, um, a lot of competition for capital, which I think sometimes bring, brings out some bad behavior, overly aggressive tactics and, you know, things like that. Um, so I think, you know, managers just need to respect the processes of LPs. You're pushing for a follow-up meeting or pushing to make a decision or creating a false sense of urgency. Like none of that really works. I think LPs are much more sophisticated now. Um, and they know what they want. They know what they're looking for. Um, so you kind of have to be, you know, respectful of that. You know, I think so. So those kinds of things are probably things that can scare off LPs. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, it actually kind of uh, resonates a lot with me when we hear from founders telling us like, hey, we're happy to get you into the round now, but you you got to make a decision by the end of the week or would love for you to try out the product, but I have a wait list of, you know, 60 people, but I can get you on right now if you want. I can just like, you know, push those other people out of the side. You know, it's <laughs> kind of the same thing when, exactly. you know, when we're talking to LPs, right? So yeah, being, being transparent, but not too aggressive, uh, knowing what they have to deal with on the other side is important. How are you focusing on growing as an LP yourself? And how do you at Fairview and the team add value to your GPs that you've been working with? We, we're always trying to get better at our job. You know, the, the second that you think that you know everything and you know what to look for and you think you know the market, or, or that, you know, to my earlier point, like that you think you have the best deal flow, you're going to start missing out on opportunities. Um, so we are always networking. We're always building relationships. We're always doing research on new trends, new ecosystems, new technologies. You know, that's why we try to see as much of the market as we can. And then as an investor in emerging funds, I think, you know, to your, the second part of the question around value add, um, that, that is really important. We, like formally, we serve on the advisory boards of almost um, all the firms that we back. But but beyond that, it's really like helping out a manager with, with whatever they might need you know, in the same way that you might help an entrepreneur right, at, at the early stages. So we don't have like a formal program that some other fund of funds might have. Um, we've always felt like that the help that each GP needs is different. It, it could be around fundraising or introduction to LPs. It could be around team building and hiring. It could be around fund administration. Um, and reporting, it could be around brand building, marketing, you know, you know whatever it is. Uh, you know, we we work pretty closely with our help, with our GPs in, in in areas that they might need help in to succeed. We'll we'll get close in, and, and you know, we'll we'll lend a hand kind of wherever we think the GP needs help. We're also not afraid to provide unsolicited advice, um, you know, if we think it will be beneficial. Just given how we invest and the amount of time we spend on getting to know teams, we develop pretty close bonds. And um, sometimes that leads to like helping out with things beyond like, you know, strategy and things like that. Like we had, you know, one GP uh, that we got pretty close with that we were like the first institutional LP and like asking us what to wear, you know, for fundraising meetings, uh, getting down to that level. So, you know, we're not afraid to help out in, in whatever, whatever way it's needed. So you're not just a, a, a institutional LP, you're also a fashion coach. You have to wear many hats, yeah. <laughs> exactly. I mean, have you had any of the GPs come to you proactively or have you come to them uh, unsolicited in terms of uh, talking about markdowns and conserv- conservatively marking their portfolio, adjusting to the current markets recently? That, that's been, uh, you know, as you can imagine, like a, a a pretty common topic of conversation when when we're talking with our GPs. It it, it really depends on the stage at which the GP is investing, and you, you know, kind of the maturity of the underlying companies, and also just you know which fund they're on. Right, if they have more mature funds, they're going to have more mature companies. Those conversations are probably more important for for later stage companies that you know maybe haven't raised. Uh, capital in, in in the last year or so, you know, we're we're trying to be uh, helpful in those conversations, like like sharing best practices from what we're seeing across our portfolio. And you know, ultimately, you know, we're getting towards the end of the year here. I think you know, as we enter twenty three and firms undergo audits, um, that'll be a big kind of input as well in, in, into you know valuation practices. But you know, whatever firms do, we just want to coach them on being really consistent and making sure that this is not a point in time change or a point in time, you know, just reaction to the market. Like whatever you implement has to be consistently kind of implemented in, in subsequent periods. So think, you know, think deeply about how you're going to approach valuations and, and make sure you kind of carry that forward. Oh yeah. I mean, auditors are going to have a field day uh, going into the end <laughs> of the year discussing, you know, how the 409A valuation has dropped 70%, but they're still holding it at the 2020 or 2021, you know, high pref priced round that was marked a couple of years ago. But speaking of audits, you know, let's just jump into it. What's your perspective on the whole FTX situation? And do you think this will have significant negative impacts across the entire venture industry when it comes to raising capital from institutional investors. Really awful and, and unfortunate, right, for, for everyone involved, but but especially for, for the customers. I mean, it's just, for me, it's mind-blowing to think about the mental gymnastics that investors and, and leaders at the company went through to get to this point. But, you know, from a venture industry perspective, I think this is what happens when, when firms raise too much money. You know, instead of respecting capital that 
firms were interested with and being diligent investors, firms started looking for places to put money as quickly as they could. And, and of course, diligence slipped. I'm surprised it did by as much as it did, but you know that's what happened. I really hope that firms learn their lessons. I know some firms have come out and apologized. You know, I don't. I don't think that's enough. You know, it was just a major, major lapse in the stewardship of capital. You know, it just has to be like, hopefully, some long-term systemic changes that come from this in terms of how firms do business. Um, I I do hope that LPs hold you know, the firms involved and, and maybe just you know firms in general more accountable. And what we saw, I think, is a clear reflection of the fact that venture doesn't scale in the way that I think folks have been trying to scale it. Uh, hopefully it causes some LPs to rethink who they invest with, their own diligence processes. Maybe it forces some LPs to take a look at more emerging managers because there is just so much more alignment in, in a lot of ways there. Yeah, I think obviously when you see tens of billions of dollars being raised for you know consecutive venture funds and there's just nowhere to deploy that capital in the asset class in general, you have these bubble situations that get just totally blown out of proportion because of FOMO and because of founders just being willing to take on more and more capital and having no freaking clue what to do with it. Our biggest lesson to our founders is only raise capital if you really know what to do with it. And even when we tell founders, hey, there's you know people interested in investing in the company, what do you want to do? And they come back and say, I don't want to raise because I don't know what to do with the money right now. And I'm just putting a higher prep stack on the cap table. I'm not going to have the liquidity event that I think I will. So I don't really think it's the right thing to do. And that's the kind of founders that, you know, we love to back at Ripple. Uh, and I think that's a very different mindset than what maybe we saw over the last couple of years where it was raised at all costs. I mean, for goodness sake, we just saw the pipe founders all resign at once with no CEO really to take over the company. And as an investor, I would be shooken from like the, the fact that you just had three co-founders, you know, resign from a $2 billion venture back startup. So we're going to see a lot more, I personally think, from the uh, blast radius of this FTX situation. I've known, you know, people personally who run capital that have been affected by this, and it's definitely, you know, shooken them to their core. So I think there's just going to be a huge, like, pause and see, you know, how people are really assessing risk and understanding capital allocation, you know, portfolio construction, due diligence process, all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree. And I think it's, I think it'll be ultimately healthy for, for the industry, but it's sad that it took something like this to, to get there. Yeah, for sure. So how are you navigating this sort of seed and early stage market for manager selection, given these current markets we're in? You know, you said that 2022 had more managers, uh, VC funds created than the prior years. So, you know, how, how is it working for you guys to really navigate this storm right now? It's, you know, I'll be honest, it's pretty hard. I think that the ratio of managers in our pipeline relative to the capacity that we have to add new managers is probably the highest it's ever been. Um, and that's despite us growing significantly in the last few years. There's just more firms out there in general. There's more talent in the venture ecosystem than, than ever before. Everyone has a good track record on paper, which, you know, still, which makes it harder um, on the initial screen. You have to do extra work almost every time. But, you know, beyond those things and beyond like team dynamics, I think at, at the early stage, seed, pre-seed, we're just, we're trying to get to who's intersecting with the most talented entrepreneurs, you know, and that's always been the most important thing, I think. Like, so, so brand and reputation within the entrepreneur community matters a ton. The ability to win deals still matters. Um, and a lot of that is tied to value add and being a good partner, you know, and, and your reputation among series A firms matters a lot too, if you're, if you're at the seed stage. So, you know, for those, like those kinds of signals, those are things that we really look at um, because in the long term, that's what's going to drive returns. Um, and, and there's, again, there's so many firms out there that, that have, you know, great track records, talented investors, great strategies, but, you know, just the things I talked about combined with what I talked about earlier around the approach to firm building, you know, kind of putting all that together is what we, what we look for, but we continue to have conviction in, in the early stage for sure. Yeah. I, I talk to people about like how they think we should be reacting to the current market environment. And yes, there's opportunities out there that are coming at more attractive prices than last year. But I mean, this is a 10 year life cycle. Um, and so to try and time, you know, the exact entry point and exit point for us is just really hard, especially at the early stage precede seed. And so, you know, it is truly about finding the best entrepreneurs 
you know, solving the biggest problems in the biggest markets that we care about. And that's why, you know, building out the platform that we have with this podcast and with our fellowship program will hopefully attract the best, uh, you know, entrepreneurs to want to talk to us and, and win deals before anyone else does. But have you seen uh, uh, new strategies pop up recently because of the market shift? Are you seeing more secondary funds come about, more opportunity funds to take advantage of the dislocation at some of the later stage, you know, growth rounds? A little bit, you know, I'm seeing definitely some more secondary funds and some new funds pop up in, in that area. You know, the opportunity fund trend, I think that's been going on for a while. So, you know, continue to see that, especially from, you know, we've had a wave of seed and in early stage funds that have been launched over the last five, six, seven years that are maturing to the point where, you know, they have a, a pretty high quality later stage portfolio where it might make sense to do an opportunity fund. But, you know, I haven't seen a ton of folks like starting an opportunity fund just to take advantage of potential down rounds or things like that. And I, I think that's partly because, you know, we haven't seen a lot of that happen yet. Um, and so maybe in anticipation of that, there might be folks that are, are considering those strategies. But, um, you know, personally, I haven't seen haven't seen a ton. Mm -hmm. My my problem with the opportunity funds is you're right. Like a lot of these bridge rounds are being done by insiders uh, or they're being totally recap, which I don't want to step in front of that. Uh, and then if you're doing secondary fund, you're likely buying common shares. I mean, you could get some prep shares, but you're likely buying common shares and then you're really stuck at, you know, uh, a high waterfall in front of you uh, if things don't work out. So there's just a lot of variabilities I feel like you have to risk adjust for in those situations. And then your time frame to follow on financing if you need it, or potentially when the IPO window opens again is also really short. So, you know, at the early stage where we're investing, I feel like we have time on our side. We have flexibility in, in burn rates uh, and capital efficiency, and then, uh, you know, variable uh, off ramps if we need it, uh, if they can't hit targets and raise follow on financing. Yeah, I agree. I think those other strategies are point in time strategies. And for us, like we're early stage focused and, and that, that is just a long term game, right? And, and so just a different, different perspective. Yeah, for sure. So what kind of a, a returns are you guys underwriting for in these markets and have they changed at all in the last, you know, 12 to 18 months? We, we really haven't adjusted our return targets for, for a long time. You know, our expectations haven't really changed. Um, you know, I can't like the SEC doesn't allow us to speak about return targets, but you, you know, we, we, we've got, you know, generally both in terms of IR and multiple and about you know pretty consistent um, range for both of those over the long term, and you know been able to hit those. Um, and in general, like relative to other asset classes, you know venture, the industry has outperformed you know over the long term, and we would expect that to continue to be the case, especially the top quartile. You know, I don't see that that changing much much at all. Are there any uh, specific investment categories that you're most excited about these days? In terms of Firm profile, you know, we continue to be excited about emerging managers. Uh, in terms of stage, we continue to be excited about early stage. And in terms of industry, you know, we, we invest in tech broadly. But, you know, some of the things that stand out to us, like the, the application of AI, you know, is going to create huge opportunities, even in unsexy industries. The internet will continue to evolve. I mean, there's going to be a next generation of the internet, you know, new e-commerce, new communication, new media opportunities are, you know, going to continue to emerge. Web3, maybe a little early for applications, but the infrastructure is, you know, being laid. Um, and so, you know, we're just bullish on tech broadly and even the intersection of tech and biology. Um, so, so no shortage of areas that we're excited about. There are so many opportunities getting created in all different aspects. You know, for us, when we say B2B enterprise SaaS, I mean, it's kind of generic now. Every single company is a tech company or tech enabled uh, company. So we have to narrow our focus as well into like developer tools, infrastructure tools and, and things like that. So uh, thanks for sharing that. You know, how do you suggest newer investors and LPs, you know, maybe some family offices or, you know, larger angels are should be thinking about the venture capital markets these days and, and how should they be thinking about mitigating risks to make sure they capture the most upside in today's markets? There's been a lot of new entrants into the industry over this last cycle. And our advice to folks has pretty much been the same. It's you, you want to consistently deploy capital. This is not a market that you can really ever time because the, the deployment of capital happens over such a long period of time and, and the companies mature over such a long period of time. 
Um, and that, you know, we talked about innovation, like innovation happens independent of market cycles and it's consistent. And if anything, it's, ac- it's accelerating. So, you know, you, you don't want to time the market. That said, vintage year diversification is critical. So you want to make sure you're, you're deploying capital across vintage years. And it's not just, you know, it's not lumpy. And, and that is all part of like taking a programmatic approach. So especially to emerging manager investing, you want to make a long-term commitment. Uh, you know, it shouldn't be, you know, well, this year I'm going to commit to a couple of emerging firms and then that's it. You know, we, we talked earlier about return dispersion. That alone you know, is a reason why you want to have an emerging manager program and, you know, invest consistently um, over time and across cycles. Yeah, for sure. I mean, for our institutional investors, it's important for them to understand that this is not just a one and done commitment. It's for, you know, future funds, fund four, fund five and beyond. And so uh, it's great to hear, you know, uh, advice like that being shared by, uh, you know, tenured firms like yourself. You know, uh, I got to ask before we jump into our final section, what is some of the best career advice you've ever received from another LP in the space? Other LPs, I I take it back to Larry and Joanne. Um, This idea of always carrying yourself with the highest integrity is something they've instilled on, on me since, since I started at Fairview and, and really across the entire firm and always doing the right thing, you know, even if it's uncomfortable or it puts you at a disadvantage or it causes you to lose out on business. You know, it's just important because to our conversation, this is a long-term industry and eventually things will catch up with you and your reputation is the most important thing you have. And I, I think that's great general life advice as well. No, for sure. That is fantastic advice. And it's something that we embody as well at Ripple. Even when we pass on a founder, you know, we want to make sure we can tell, help them out by introducing them to other founders, you know, do the right thing because the journey that they're on is, is just as hard, if not harder than the same journey that we're experiencing uh, at Ripple as well. So thanks for sharing that. You know, before we wrap things up, we always ask our guests for their fast favorites. So first off, your favorite podcast. I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, one that I like a lot recently, which is kind of new, is one. It's called Plain English with Derek Thompson. He's a he's a writer for The Atlantic, and he does this great podcast on tech, culture, and politics with some great guests. And it's very clear, concise, short conversations. You get a ton of information in pretty condensed format. So I love that one. I haven't heard that one before. I got to check that out. Next is your favorite newsletter or blog. I, I go to a lot of websites every day because it's important to stay informed. Um, I still, you know, Hacker News has been around a long time. I still visit that a couple times a day. The The Verge for me for tech news is a good source. And then um, I like The Ringer for sports and pop culture. Wow. Going old school on the tech blogs. That's fantastic. Your favorite tech gadget? Right now, it's this thing called the Owlet. We have a seven seven month old baby at home, and so this is a device that monitors the baby's vitals while they sleep, and it it, it connects to your phone um, over Wi Fi, and so you get an update if anything like it is a mess. It you know with with all the sicknesses that have been going around this uh, th- this fall and this winter, it's the one thing that's helped us sleep well through the night. So that's that's my favorite right now. That's a good one. So we went with the Nanit. We have a 16 month at hold at home and she's not feeling well either as everyone is not feeling well, but it is amazing to be able to have that on your phone, anywhere you go. You know, when we have someone, uh, you know, house sitting, you know, they say, where's the baby monitor to watch the old school one. It's like, no, no, no we don't have that. We have it on our phones and in our devices. We take it with us. It, it's a great little contraption. Uh, very cool. Next one, favorite new trend. So having a baby and we have a four-year-old too, we're like fully removed from any trends. There's no time for anything other than work and family. Um, so, you know, but if I have to say anything, I think it's just this, like the general health and wellness trend that's been going on for several year, years, I think just has forced us to find time to exercise and eat healthy, which I think has been great because it just improves your quality of life. It gives you energy and you need a ton of energy when you have kids. It's true. A lot of people thought like this health trend that we were going through during the pandemic because no one had anything else to do besides hop on a Peloton, I don't think is really going away. I mean, even though we can look at Peloton stock, but that's not a barometer for how well the health trend is doing. That's just because of their incredibly mismanagement of you know hardware. But you know that that is definitely true. And, and me and my family have definitely continued that uh, during uh, the last year, even though the pandemic has sort of waned. So I um, appreciate you sharing that. Next one is your favorite book. I like to read a lot. Um, so I don't have like a favorite book, but one that I like that I read recently is this book called The Big Picture by this theoretical physicist uh, by the name of Sean Carroll. And he does an amazing job connecting physics, general relativity, quantum mechanics, biology, even some philosophy and, and all together. And if you can't tell by what I do for a career, like I'm, I'm the kind of person who 
loves the big picture and I also need to know how everything works. And so this is that at the biggest scale. Um, and it's just fascinating stuff, at least for me. That sounds like Stephen Hawking stuff. Exactly. That's what it is. That's what it is. <laughs> exactly. And last but not least, your favorite life lesson. I'll, I'll tie it back to this book too. Just like having perspective, right? I think we, we always tend to get caught up in the moment, the current trends, the news cycle, and especially in our industry, like, you know, whether you're an entrepreneur, you're a VC or an LP, it's just so easy to get caught up in what's happening today, this week, this month. Um, but we just need to remember what we do is very long-term in nature. Uh, if you just follow your passion and if, if, if you just find yourself overwhelmed, remember to take a step back and remind yourself of, of what really matters. That's great advice. And yeah, you got to zoom out sometimes to be able to be able to focus on things that really matter, uh, which is great. And thank you so much for joining us in the tank today with Akar Vachani, partner at Fairview Capital. Thank you, Matt. Thanks for listening to another episode of Tank Talks. To learn more about this episode, be sure to go to Apple Podcast or Spotify to find more detailed notes on this episode or to check out previous episodes. Also, if you enjoyed this episode, please leave us a review and a rating as it helps us out a lot and hit that subscribe button so you can get notified when new episodes come out. Finally, make sure to give me a follow on Twitter at Maddie B. Cohen or at Tank Talk Podcast to stay up to date on new episodes or to be a guest on our show. Till next time.